In this video, I'm going to cover the secrets to knowing and becoming yourself. So it's been a while since I've created a video, so I want to come back and share some of these ideas with you that I've been thinking about. Uh, and I'm gonna be creating a lot more videos as well, so I hope you'll stick around for them as well. Uh, so the secrets to knowing and becoming yourself. Sounds a bit cheesy calling them secrets. It's a bit of a good marketing ploy. You know, secrets, ooh, what is it? What are these mystery ideas? But I do have some quotes by Jung that explain kind of why I called it secrets. Uh, so stick around for that. Uh, but what I want to do in this video is I'm going to do this in a few different uh, sections and parts. So the first part is going to be talking about these principles, uh, these psychological principles of knowing and becoming yourself. And then the second half of the video is going to be more practical, down-to-earth things that you can actually do to learn about yourself, to understand yourself, and to go and become uh, who you are. So the first idea is uh, I want to kind of introduce a few concepts. So I'm going to talk about Jung's individuation process, a little bit about uh, Nietzsche's idea of becoming who you are, um, and then we're going to get into the psychological interpretation of some of the Christian scriptures from Jung's point of view, and um, then we'll move to the more practical stuff on your self-concept, your identity, understanding how to reflect on yourself, and um, some other more uh, modern psychological approaches as well. Okay, so the first thing I think I want to frame this with is, um, well, I guess in general, we know in life, uh, we want to know about ourselves. That's what psychology is about, right? We want to know more about ourselves. We want to know, we do personality quizzes. Uh, even if we look up different uh, uh, mental health issues that we might have, we actually want to know and understand why we are dealing with what we're dealing with. Like if I have depression, we want to understand what is it that I can do uh, to work through this depression and, and what is it about me like see that's the whole purpose of going to a therapist right you're trying to gain insight into what you can do for yourself you're trying to gain insight into yourself right if you have issues in a relationship you're trying to understand yourself and the other person so there's always this process of self-reflection of exploration of the self, knowing ourselves. And then there's this other idea of becoming yourself. Now that's a little bit different, right? And it's a little bit harder to grasp. It might even sound a bit woo-woo. What do you mean becoming yourself? What does that even mean, right? And so I think a good way to introduce becoming yourself is through uh, these ideas in Nietzsche. So the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, he has uh, these lingering ideas of becoming yourself, right? And it's similar to the idea of self-realization. And you, you become yourself and you, um, you, out of yourself, you create something. And, and that um, comes from these, these Nietzschean ideas. And Nietzsche borrows this idea from the Greek poet Pindar, and Pindar says, and I quote, become who you are, close quote. It's a small quote, become who you are. Now, in Nietzschean thought, it's kind of, he's kind of like a biological determinist in the sense that um, our behaviors come out of this predetermined structure or nature of who we are, right? And so, uh, in essence, you everything that you are going to become is already inside of you because, uh, you know, you are, you have all the things in you that you are ever going to be, 
right? It's just time hasn't passed for those things to materialize, you know, or another way to look at it is your potential um, hasn't had that time yet to actualize, right? So, but, but that potential is already in you, you know, the oak tree, the print, the blueprint for the oak tree, everything that needs uh, that is necessary for the oak tree to come into existence is in uh, the acorn, right? So that's like us. We are born with a certain character, a certain uh, uh, structure, a certain personality, if you will, right? We, got, we know that we have certain particular genetics that turn on and off depending on if we're exposed to a certain environment or not. So there is this interplay between, you know, your genetics and the environment, but you're not going to be anything or become anything that you are not fundamentally, right? I'm never going to be a basketball player in the NBA. That's impossible for me. I'm, uh, I'm shorter than the average guy, but I'm taller than the average woman. So lucky for me, at least I'm not completely relegated to whatever, but that's another subject. <laughs> but the idea is that you are born with certain characteristics, certain potentials, and your goal in life is to steward those potentials. So your decisions that you make, the freedom you exercise and that you have, is only along this fixed line of who you already are. And that's what it means to become who you are. You're actualizing the potential of who you are and, and, and what you have to bring to the surface, so to speak. And so, um, yes, you have a particular pattern. You're born into a particular family in a particular culture. And these are the constraints on your creativity for fashioning out of your particular circumstances uh, something uh, great or something out of yourself. Right, so that's kind of the Nietzschean kind of views around uh, becoming yourself. It's a kind of destiny in a sense, right? So let's now move on to uh, more of a Jungian idea. And so Jung's ideas are very similar because he builds a lot of his work off Nietzsche. However, there's this kind of added layer in a sense, right? And so I've got this quote here that I'm going to read. Open quote, nature is not only aristocratic, she is also esoteric, yet no man of understanding will thereby be induced to make a secret of what he knows, for he realizes only too well that the secret of psychic development can never be betrayed, simply because that development is a question of individual capacity, close quote. So you can see there what I meant in the beginning about secret. Now, I'll explain this a little bit. Jung here is talking about the key word is, the key phrase there is psychic development. So Jung sees uh, things similar to Nietzsche in the sense that we uh, develop ourselves as we go through our life. We are, we are becoming who we are. We have that particular structure that we are uniquely given when we're born and we work, uh, given that structure, we work with that to become something, right? But the added layer with Jung is that this psychic development, this psychic um, self-actualization that happens comes through uh, this partnering with the unconscious, right? And so that's where Jung uh, with his psychoanalytic ideas, is introducing this process of what Jung calls individuation. And individuation is an adaptation to what Jung calls the inner reality. So just as you, there's an adaptation to the world where you integrate into society, you get a job, you, uh, you, know, you get married, you start a family, you do all the regular things that society expects of you, Jung has this other idea of individuation, which is an adaptation to the inner reality of things, which is this kind of seemingly mystical type of um, experience. Uh, and that's why Jung here is calling it a secret, 
right? Um, but is the secret of psychic development. So it is, it, it's basically uh, someone who is becoming more conscious of the unconscious processes and they are integrating and broadening their personality. So they are becoming whole in who they are. They are increasing their potential of who they are, right? By assimilating these unconscious processes into their personality, right? For Freud, it was you had repressed sexual desires and you were to go out and, you know, um, and, and try to integrate that sexuality into your life. For Jung, it's much broader than that. It's not just uh, sex or aggression. It is uh, this whole totality of life, which we've known through religious experiences, through, we see in mythology, but in this sense, it is, um, Jung tries to psychologize it, and he sees it as um, a psychic development. It is a part of our psyche. It is a part of our psychological progression, and these religious figures are symbols of the mind. And so, and they help us broaden our personality. They help us uh, actualize our potential. And he also puts it as um, the number one personality, which is our regular life we're living with our conscious mind. And the number two personality is what Jung would call the self or the totality of the psyche or the God image, right? And so the idea is that the God image is the, the broader, wider personality, the aspects of ourselves that we didn't know we were a part of, right? And so, um, in practical terms, you may lose a part of yourself because you have to sacrifice a part of yourself to go and work or learn or do something and in the world, right? And then you leave behind an aspect of your personality. And maybe later in life, you come and you uh, rediscover those aspects of yourself that you left behind when you were younger because you had to sacrifice those to go and participate in society and, and live out maybe a profession or something like that. That is a practical example of the ideas um, that I'm talking about here, right? Of the, the self and the ego expanding and, 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 and your consciousness expanding to assimilate uh, the transpersonal personality is basically what it is, right? So, um, so what I'm going to do here is I want to introduce some of these concepts from the Christian scriptures. Now, I think it's important to understand, as I just mentioned before, that these are to be seen as, as, uh, is not literal. So we're not going to take these Christian scriptures as literal, like a literal Christian would, uh, like a like a literalist Christian, right? Um, we're going to look at them through the lens of Jungian psychology, which takes them to be uh, some type of, of structure of the unconscious psyche, right? And so um, in Jungian psychology, we look at mythology, we look at of these scriptures and we can see archetypal patterns, we can see uh, principles of uh, psychology. Uh, and, and that's basically um, the Jungian perspective. So when I read this, uh, don't take it literally. We're taking it as a principle of our psychology. Now that doesn't mean I am reducing this only to, uh, to that. I'm actually elevating our, our psychology to something greater than we thought it was, really. Um, and so, it will make more sense as I, as I go through it. So, so here's a quote uh, from Jung. The reason why Jesus' words have such suggestive power is that they express the symbolical truths which are rooted in the very structure of the human psyche. Close quote. So that's to reinforce what I just said. Now I'm going to uh, read a quote from the Bible um, about Jesus talking to his disciples. Open quote. The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, 
but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Close quote. So you can see there with that quote that Jesus is saying to his disciples, these are secrets and not everyone will understand them. You see, I draw that parallel between what Jesus is saying there with his disciples and what Jung said earlier about psychic development, that that psychic development is a secret and it can never be betrayed simply because everyone has an individual capacity. So those who can't understand, they can't understand the secret of someone who is more developed, right, in their personality. So someone who is, Jung puts it this way, there's someone called, in, in relationships, sometimes there's a container and a contained. And the contained loses their personality in the container. The container is, a, is someone who is, has a, a large breadth and depth of personality. They are so broad in their thinking, their understanding. They're a real, what we'd call, oh, they're a real personality. They're just, you know, they got it all almost, right? So you'll see different people in the world have different limits to how, uh, how broad their personality is, right? And, and in Jungian terms, we'd call that wholeness. How whole someone is. Wholeness doesn't mean perfection, but it's an integration of conflicting um, aspects of, of ourselves. So that's the whole idea of the integration of the opposites. And, and what that means is, is there's, there's different opposites. So let's just take thinking and feeling, right? You've got people who are really hyper-rational, but they're not good at dealing with other people socially. Right? Or you've got people who are really good socially, but they can't think through problems and solve them. But then you've got someone who can do both, and they hold them in this tension. And out of that tension between dealing with people, but also being um, very rational and being able to solve problems, through holding that in their life, they, they become stronger, and they actually um, they manifest that broader aspect, that person who can handle a lot more than those people who are just one-sided, right? And that's only one example. We can talk about this in, in many different uh, ways and contexts, okay? So the idea here, and you know, you're going to say, well, well, did Jesus really mean that? What was Jesus talking about, right? And as I read that um, quote out before, that Jung said that the reason why Jesus' uh, words have such suggestive power is because he's talking about the symbolical truths, right? Now, I've made another video called uh, Jung's Deeper Meaning of Introversion. So if you go and watch that, you'll understand what I'm talking about here. But just a quick recap, in that video, I explain how Jung talks about um, and interprets uh, Jesus' message of the kingdom of God, and that the kingdom of God really is the domain of the soul. The domain, the kingdom of God is the domain of God, and that domain is the domain of the soul. And that's where kind of God operates. And this is meant to be not literal, but a psychodynamic state. Okay? So it's, it's, it's a part of our, how our psyche operates, right? And that's why people throughout history have experienced this of what they think of as God, and they project uh, into their literature this idea of a literal God, uh, but it is actually a manifestation of their psychological, a psychological process that, that Jung is saying is unconscious. So that's his interpretation of the kingdom of God. So here in this parable that I just read out, where Jesus talks about um, the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, the secrets of the kingdom have been given to you, but not to them. It's the secrets of the soul. You see? So that's the interpretation. So if you want to go check out my other video, Jung's Deeper Meaning of Introversion, that 
uh, I go into understanding that idea of the kingdom of God as the soul. So here I can see the secrets of the kingdom of heaven or the secrets of the soul are given to you. Now, how do you know that as well? Because he says, whoever has more will be given and they will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. Now, what is it that's taken from them? Well, in another translation, I'm pretty sure uh, this is the NIV, but in another translation, it actually says uh, knowledge. It is knowledge that is given. You will have more knowledge and, and knowledge will be taken away. What it, so what that means is, is it's that idea that Jung was talking about. If you don't have the potential to actually actualize and understand and assimilate um, this idea of connecting to uh, what's called God in the soul, or Jung talks in the psychodynamic state as the buildup of the libido in, uh, in the unconscious, then uh, if you don't understand that, if you can't tap into that, uh, then you, you will lose what little understanding you do have of it. And we understand this normally through our feelings, through our deep sense and feeling of uh, connection to what Jung would call the God image. Um, and I guess what literalist Christians call as God, right? Uh, but it is a psychodynamic state. It doesn't matter what you believe, you can connect to this inner value, right? And that's what the kingdom of God is. It's the treasure hidden in a field. It's the inner value hidden in your soul. Um, it's coming to terms with the inner aspect of yourself, right? So this is why I'm introducing this, because in Jungian psychology, there's the idea of the God image is what helps you individuate into your full potential, into who you are, right? It is the broader personality that helps you uh, actualize your potential. Or in the old language, it's God helping you fulfill your purpose, helping you uh, manifest your potential into life, right? And in everyday life, it's Inside you, you feel like you can be more and there's something in you that feels valuable and you, and you know that it, something about connecting to that inner value makes you want to actually uh, become something and, and do something in the world. You know, w when you connect to this inner peace, you want to actually actualize that in, in your life, right? And um, I believe we all experience something like that. Right. Okay. So let's move on now to this closing off this point, And then I'll move on to some other points is there's this idea uh, in, in Jung's writings that he quotes this alchemical text from John Portage. Right. And so this is what John Portage says in his alchemical text, open quote. This true philosophy will teach you how you should know yourselves. And if you know yourselves rightly, you will also know the pure nature, for the pure nature is in yourself. And when you know the pure nature, which is your true selfhood, freed from all wicked, sinful selfishness, then also you will know God, for the Godhead is concealed and wrapped in the pure nature, like a kernel in the nutshell, close quote. So Jung quoted that in his works, in the practice of psychotherapy, and that is an alchemical text, right? And so you can see, so we, we use the Christian scriptures, we use this alchemical text. There's this linkage, this archetypal linkage or relationship with the idea of God or the ultimate value in us to this idea of selfhood and self-identity with this idea of knowing yourself and becoming yourself, right? And so this is why I'm presenting these ideas to you because this is kind of the Jungian idea of knowing and becoming yourself. You're getting in touch with the unconscious and you're assimilating that into your life 
and that is helping your identity and personality expand, right? Uh, so let's move on to some of these principles here. So now that I've described a little bit about Nietzsche's ideas on becoming yourself and the Jungian kind of interpretation of religion and how that links to knowing and becoming ourselves, I want to outline some of these principles uh, that you can act upon to delve further into this. So the first thing is only you can know and become yourself. Only you can do it. No one else can do it for you whatsoever. And there's a good uh, quote here from Nietzsche, open quote, no one can build you the bridge on which you and only you must cross the river of life. There may be countless trials and bridges and demigods who would gladly carry you across, but only at the price of pawning and forgoing yourself. There is one path in the world that none can walk but you. Where does it lead? Don't ask. Walk. So you see there, Nietzsche is saying, there's, you know, you ha the only way to do it is to do it yourself. Many other people will want to carry you across. What that means is, is there'll be gurus out there, people on YouTube, right? Other people in life at churches, synagogues, wherever they are, people, even business people, politicians, whoever they are, they will promise you something. They will promise you a life. They will, even your family members, they will try to tell you what to do, but they can't tell you what to do. They can't know the unique structure of who you are. They can't tell the, your unique connection to the unconscious and, and, and your uh, life and your individual circumstances. And that's what I find a lot of the time, even family members, they talk to you and they give you stock standard advice and it's not really tailor made to who you really are. People aren't very good at listening. They're not very good at discovering who other people are, let alone discovering who they are themselves, right? So they're not going to listen to you and actually know about you enough to give you the specifics of what you should do if you should do this and that. You have to think through these things yourself, right? And uh, you don't want to actually forgo yourself, Nietzsche is saying here. And, he, and, and I love it at the end that he says, where does it lead? Don't ask, just walk. In other words, you don't always know really where you're going, right? And, and that's why, because you are, you are yourself and you're, you're becoming yourself. It, it's like you're, it's, you know what I mean? It's not always a straightforward path. I've even seen if, if the path is very clear, you're probably living someone else's path. Right, so it's meant to be a bit murky, and that's okay. That's part of the process of becoming yourself, because you are becoming yourself from within yourself. You're not looking at yourself from outside, and it, you know. And so, if someone gives you some path, some plan to do, and convinces you to do something, then it might all be clear, because they're saying you go from A to B, A to B, A to C, whatever. You go and you follow that. Bob's your uncle. Your life is on track. But no, it's not. It's on someone else's track. It's not on your track, right? And so that's the first principle. Only you know who you are and, and only you can actually become yourself. Now, I want to read this other quote by Jung, which, is, which, will, which kind of parallels that quote by Nietzsche. Okay, open quote. The aim of individuation is nothing less than to, to divest the self of the false wrappings of the persona on the one hand and of the suggestive powers of primordial images on the other. Close quote. So now we can know through that quote what Nietzsche meant about there's demigods who will gladly carry you across this bridge, this bridge of life that you're crossing, right? Because what happens is, if people get caught up in the persona, they get caught up in worldly affairs, right? They become uh, a psychologist or they become, uh, you know, a bricklayer. And then that's all they are. They become a real estate agent, right? Their, their identity rests in their persona. And then that's dangerous because when they lose their job, they become sick or the government shuts them down. 
What happens is, is they lose their identity as well. Because all they had was not their true identity. They had only the persona. Now, the persona is necessary to function in the world. And, you know, I'm not, we need a balanced view. You still want to function in the world, right? You still want to, uh, you know, we need to make a living. We need to do stuff like that. There's a very practical reason for the persona. But overly identifying with it you know, to the point of becoming a singular one-sided personality uh, comes at the cost of losing yourself, right? And so uh, these people will gladly carry you across. That second half of Jung's uh, quote there is protect yourself of the suggestive powers of the primordial images. So this is what happens in religion a lot with religious people. And so you go to church and these pastors, these preachers, they'll want to carry you across. They don't, they, they will say, oh, Jesus is doing it, whatever. But it's these, they're using these archetypal images, right? And they themselves might be stuck in these archetypal images under the influence, if you will, of these archetypal images, right? So that's why I give you that warning. Don't take these scriptures literal because I don't want you to, you know, I'm not trying to create a cult here. You know, I'm not trying to, uh, you know, have you under the influence of these these powerful kind of um, archaic images that speak to us. I don't want to use them to abuse you. And I'm not saying all churches do that, but unconsciously, unconsciously, they they want to lead the flock. Some of them say, lead their flock, be a shepherd. You know, I, no, you don't want a shepherd. You are your own man, your own woman. You don't need someone else to guide you into your destiny, right? And so uh, they're the two things to watch out for. You know, people in the world will say, you need to do this and that. You need to buy a house, get married, blah, blah, blah. That's the false wrappings of the persona. People, you know, who evolved involved in religious things and, 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 and in a lot of other ways, these suggestive primordial images can grip you. Ideologies, political ideologies can grip you. You don't want that because you're not going to be yourself. You're going to be a parrot. That's that whole meme. Um, what is it? NPC, that, me that meme. You become like this robot for the ideology. You don't want that. That's what you're trying to avoid. That's what Nietzsche meant by these demigods are carrying you. They'll be glad to carry you across. You need to look out for these demigods, all right? You need to be yourself, right? Only you know your destiny. You can't follow anyone. Don't follow a guru. Now, there is a counterbalanced teaching to that because Jung actually talks about sometimes people do need some type of model for a little while. You know, the idea of apprenticeship. We, You know, that's a legitimate idea to... Be an apprentice for a little while when you learn the ropes and then you break off and be yourself. But that's the thing. You have to eventually break off and be yourself. The master can only teach you for so long until you have to break away and either take over or go off and do your own thing. So that's kind of the pattern of that. So that's a little bit of balance to this equation. All right. Now, the next principle is... You must pay a price to become yourself. You must actually pay a price. Um, because there's this idea in Jungian psychology uh, that to enter the process of individuation, you are actually adapting to your inner reality, right? You're not adapting to the outer reality of work and integrating into society. And because individuation is adapting to the inner reality, that means you need to actually pay a price because the world still demands something of you, right? You can't just be selfish and go away and be too preoccupied with yourself. You start talking about this to other people and they'll, they'll, they'll think you're crazy, right? But that goes back to the whole idea of, you know, Jesus and Jung also talking about um, the idea of, it being a secret, you know, because not everyone actualizes and comes in touch with themselves, right? Most people default to being told who they are by the world. And that is the default position of most people. What I'm trying to teach you is these other ideas. But what I want you to know is it comes at a cost. 
there's a price to pay for playing around with yourself, right? And um, it's not actually for everyone, right? Uh, Jung actually recommends that most people just go out there, submit to some type of uh, tried and true path that is already out there. That's what Peterson, Jordan Peterson, recommends to a lot of people. But what Peterson doesn't show uh, is what Jung talks about. And Jung talks about the individuation process, adapting to who you are. And that's similar to Nietzsche's idea of creating out of yourself something unique that is separate from the tradition, right? Um, So let me read this quote by Jung, open quote, the individual is obliged by the collective demands to purchase his individuation at the cost of an equivalent work for the benefit of society. So far as this is possible, individuation is possible. Anyone who cannot do this must submit directly to the collective demands, to the demands of society, or rather, he will be caught by them automatically. What society demands is imitation or conscious identification, a treading of accepted and authorized paths. Only by accomplishing an equivalent is one exempted from this, close quote. So you can see there what I mean. You need to offer up an equivalent work or you need to take an alternative path that is equivalent and you need to actually, it needs to actually be substantiated. It can't just be some flimsy, wishy-washy nothing. Now, you might not always know where it's completely heading, right? Because it's a hard road to take. This is a harder road to take. But to purchase your freedom from the herd, You need to actually create something of enough value to exchange for your freedom and your individuality. Only then will other people accept uh, that you are legitimate, right? And even then they might not accept it. You know, know, that's the problem, the conflict, especially that creative people come up against, right? Because other people who take the tried and true authorized paths of society they don't understand how anyone could think differently or think on their own. So you have to be, have all your ducks in a row and you have to set up something legitimate uh, out of yourself. And it has to be um, something substantial that actually has objective value in order to purchase your freedom, right? That is a secret, really, I guess. You know, it's not a secret. It's just It just makes sense, really. But... This is what I'm presenting to you, right? So let me read this next quote by Jung. Open quote. Individuation cuts one off from personal conformity and hence from collectivity. That is the guilt which the the individuant leaves behind from the world. That is the guilt he must endeavor to redeem. He must offer a ransom in place of himself. That is, he must bring forth values which are an equivalent substitute for his absence in the collective personal sphere. Without this production of values, final individuation is immoral and more than that, suicidal. The man who cannot create values should sacrifice himself consciously to the spirit of collective conformity. In so doing, he is free to choose the collectivity, choose the collectivity to which he will sacrifice himself. Only to the extent that a man creates objective values can he and may he individuate. Every further step in individuation creates new guilt and necessitates new expiation. Hence, individuation is possible only so long as substitute values are produced. Individuation is exclusive adaptation to inner reality and hence an allegedly mystical process. The expiation is adaptation to the outer world. 
It has to be offered to the outer world and the petition that the outer world accept it, close quote. So you can see there, if you were going to individuate, if you're going to connect to your inner reality, if you're going to go off and try to understand who you are at the deepest levels, you know, Nietzsche said, I bored into the foundations. If you want to go into yourself, understand yourself, become conscious of who you are, and then try to actualize your life out of the inner knowledge of understanding of who you are, if you try to actualize your life from that position, you will discover that you have unique, specific values that don't align up with the broader society and culture, right? And your job is to bring those out of you and manifest them in concrete terms into the world. You have to actually perform a work. You have to actually take a path that is legitimate in your own way, according to your own law and principle, and establish that in the world. That's what you have to do if you want to become yourself. Otherwise, you follow what the tradition and what the world has already given you. There's many paths out there, but they're traditional paths. You become a lawyer, you become a banker, you become a chef. You know, you do what is already out there for people to tell you to what to do, right? If you want to go off and create your own thing, right? Now, it might involve something like that. You might be this like crazy chef or something, right? But you're not going to just the restaurant down the road. I mean, you might start off there. That's the whole idea of apprenticeship. That's why I put that in there. You can, you know, you, you, of course we go out and we, we get a job. It's, these are the practical things we do. But if you really want to ha like combine your inner revelations and your deep inner world and the relationship with, with yourself, if you want to actually take that beyond just sitting in your bedroom and you want to actually actualize those things in your, in your life, you're going to have to do and pick an equivalent task or way um, and actually actualize it, concretize it. You know, it needs to actually, something actually needs to be created out of you, right? And, and, and a lot of that comes through understanding these values and substantiating those values and living by them in, in, the, in your actual life. That's how you actually become yourself. It's not just some heady thing of knowing, oh, I'm like this, I'm like that. That is part of the process. But the end result is you actually build on your knowledge of who you are. And building means actualizing in tangible reality uh, the aspects of your potential, right? So let's move on, okay? Here is another quote Open quote, we overlook the essential fact that the social goal is attained only at the cost of a diminution of personality, close quote. That is looking at this problem that we're talking about of the value exchange, the price you have to pay to individuate, to become yourself from the opposite side and the opposite standpoint. You don't get to not give up something, right? Even if you take the tried and true path, what you gain is you gain safety. That's what most people I've talked to who uh, have done a traditional path say to me. One of my best friends, he has stayed in accounting ever since we both studied accounting over 10 years ago. He's still an accountant. I always say to people, I would be like him if I stayed in accounting. And he basically always says, and he's always worried, and he always wants to change, and he, he says to me, I know this isn't me. I know this isn't me. And he said it all along, but he's stuck in there. He says, you know, the hard thing is you get employed, and then you end up getting more money, and I know it's not me, but look, you know, it's the safe path. It gives him security. That's why most people pick the tried and true traditional path, and that um, comes at a cost, though. That comes at the cost of what Jung says, a diminution of personality. That means a loss of their personality. You see? That means a narrowing of their personality. You see, they've lost other aspects that they had as a child. And hopefully, as they get older, they'll be able to integrate that back in. But it's not guaranteed. What I'm, what I'm bringing you, to you today is if you can 
understand yourself at the deepest level and uh, in the psychoanalytic way and and become conscious of who you are, the aspects of who you are, which we'll get into in a practical sense later, the structure of your personality, the uniqueness, if you can understand that and then actually offer up something, then you can get both and you win the game of life. You get your personality, you keep your soul, in other words, and you also can, can make money and live a normal life. Like normal as in you've got money to live because you've offered up something of objective value. That's what you have to do, right? You have to appease society, but you have to work on yourself. But most people, they just appease society and they don't work on themselves. They're depressed. They don't know what to do. They don't know who they are, where they're going or what life's about because they've never explored the depths. They never bored into the foundations. All right, I wanna read this next quote, open quote. An example of the alteration of personality in the sense of diminution is furnished by what is known in primitive psychology as loss of soul. The peculiar condition covered by this term is accounted for in the mind of the primitive by the supposition that a soul has gone off just like a dog that runs away with his master overnight, from his master overnight. It is then the task of the medicine man to fetch the fugitive back, close quote. So you can see there, Jung's phrase, the diminution of personality is equivalent to, in ancient times, what they would call the loss of soul, right? And I think that's highly interesting. That is highly interesting. So you can say, that's why a lot of people feel like they've lost their soul. I go into work every day. My soul is crushed. You know, it's like soul crushing to be here. Why do we use those phrases? Because that's what it is. You have to take on the persona. Think about it. You think this is fun and games. You think it's not affecting you. If you go into a place every day and you have to put on a certain face because you have to do that to perform at work. You have to do that to be effective. And I get that. And that makes sense. That's what you should do. But it comes at a price. Doing that, taking on that role, you are becoming that solo thing. And maybe you need to come that for a while. Maybe that's your apprenticeship. But at the same time, a lot of people, they get stuck in it and they, they become that rigid personality. I love this phrase. You know that it's an old kind of saying and it's... um. Oh, what is it like? Don't um, don't screw up your face, or the, the wind might change. Have you ever heard that? You know, like when you're a kid, you were like poking out your tongue, you're like, uh, bleh, and then and then you know, an adult said, "Oh, don't do that, or the wind might change." You know, and so if the, the implication being, if the wind changes, your face gets stuck like that. That's a good mental image of what happens to people like my friend, one of my best friends, who. You know, imagine being an accountant. There's probably a lot of accountants. I don't know if an accountants are watching this. A lot of people who watch my channel are quite open, creative people. But, uh, and, you know, but I always say to my friend, you're a calculator. <laughs> but it's like, that's what you've become. you become a calculator, right? Now, I don't want to belittle people, though, because, you know, Obviously, you still have a family. You can still have a family. You can st this, you know, and you need to you need to work, right? So you see how there's a tension here. There's a tension because you need to do this. You need to survive. But at the same time, I know you know deep down this isn't really me. But I just got to do it, and that's right. That's exactly it. That's what society is. That's the reality of things. That's the objective reality of things. But subjectively. A lot of the time we feel bad about this, that we're stuck here. And that's why I'm trying to present this. There is this inner life that we have that we want to cultivate, our soul. We want to cultivate our soul, baby. That's what we want. We want the juice of life, right? But we also want to survive. And we also, we actually, it would be good if we were financially successful. Let's admit it. We want both, right? We want both. That is the tension. That's the tension that we, we have. It's the tension between our self-identity and the world. That we all live and all go through that, that archetypal tension and process. And that's a part of individuation that we have to uh, reckon with in our life. 
Now, let me go to this next quote. Okay, so this is a quote uh, from Jesus in the Bible. Open quote. When he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Quote, close, quote. You can see there that quote by Jesus exactly the problem that we're talking about here. Now remember, don't take this literally as some literalist Christian. They're going to pervert what this means. The real power of this scripture is understood psychologically. And it's this. It's a, this is exact problem that I'm talking about. And it even says it in there. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? You see? This is where the ego, the ego loves its own life. You have to give up that persona, that ego, and take up the, the divine calling, let's call it, or going after, see, because in, in Jungian psychology, Christ is a symbol of the self, and the self being the totality of the psyche, the bigger personality that you, that's helping you self-actualize, um, or wholeness. It's known as the archetype of wholeness. And that is the greater aspect of your personality that you're trying to follow and integrate into your life to become whole. So that's this process. You lay up your own life, you know, what the world expects of you. See? The world. You gain, what is a profit? To gain the whole world. Even the whole world isn't worth your soul, let alone this microcosm of the world that you call a job or you call this or that. That's not worth, worth the price of your soul. Nothing is more valuable than your soul. That's why the kingdom of God is the great treasure hidden in the field, which is your soul, right? It's the treasure in your soul. It's, it's, it's more valuable than what you can get out there because it actually gives you real satisfaction. In fact, anything we see valuable outside of us is just a projection of the value that is already comes from within us, you see? And so, um, that there perfectly describes the problem. And there's this idea of taking up the cross. So, that, so remember, this is still in, under that principle of you have to pay a price. You have to give up your life, what you see consciously as your life according to the world's eyes. And you have to take up um, following your life in adapting to the inner reality which Jung would call the God image or wholeness, right? The archetype of wholeness or the self, right? And in the old language, they called it God, okay? But this is a psychodynamic uh, approach to discovering the inner depths of yourself, right? It actually requires this process, this extreme type of breaking away because that's how you individuate. You are adapting to the inner world, not to the outer world. That's what individuation is, according to Jung. And that's why it's dangerous, right? Not everyone should do this. Not everyone should do this, man. Honestly, this is dangerous. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that soon, right? Um, okay, let's go to this next quote, open quote. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that some said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, 
No one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Close quote. So remember, we're interpreting the kingdom of God through the lens of Jungian psychology, which interprets the kingdom of God as the domain of the soul and the, the buildup of the libido, which is the ultimate value in the unconscious, right? And, and so um, if we interpret that scripture through that, we can see these are the warnings. Jesus is, this is the cost of being, of, of following this way. The cost of individuation, you might say, right? What does it mean when Jesus says the foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests? He's basically saying, look, look, man, you want to individuate? You want to come with me? You know, you want to follow the self? You want to follow the archetype of the self? You want to expand into the, the ultimate personality that you were destined for? You want to, uh, you know, bring out into reality the inner potentials that are in you? If you want to be adapted to this inner reality and do that, then, man, you're going to be wandering around in the wilderness, man. You're going to be like down near a river. You know, you're going to be in a van beside the river. You're going to be wandering around. I don't have a home, man. I'm. Be See what I mean? It's like that. You're going to be wandering around. This is going to be hard. This ain't going to be easy. The next thing, right? The guy says, let me go first bury my father. No. All these concerns, these these cultural concerns you have, they don't matter. When the unconscious speaks, you got to listen. If, if you were going to follow and adapt to the inner reality, as Jung says, the inner world, right? Some live by society, the external world, and some live by the inner world, Jung says, basically. If you want to live by the inner world, you got to listen and you got to be ready to go. You know, you got to be in tune and you got to be ready to go, man. Um, because look at that, no one who puts his hand to the plow, looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Don't look back. You can't look back. This is the price you have to pay to really become yourself, right? Now, following on that, ending that idea, this other quote, open quote, Lot's life looked back and she became a pillar of salt, close quote. So that is a story in Genesis of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. God is destroying th this city, Sodom and Gomorrah, and Lot uh, is, is leaving that place, so he doesn't get destroyed, because God's destroying it in the Old Testament. And uh, his wife looks back and turns into a pillar of salt. Now, did this literally happen? <laughs> uh, you know, I don't think so. But it's, it's, a, it's an analogy for looking back. You don't look back Right? And, and that's, that's the whole idea. Don't look back. If you're going to do this, you can't look back. It's like the Matrix, right? If you take the red pill, there's no going back, boy. You're not, you're not going back to the, uh, to the Matrix, right? <laughs> you, you're getting out of there, you're going to the real world, right? And it's kind of strange because in this analogy, that would make the real world the adaptation to the inner world. So, I don't know. Maybe it's delusional. I don't know. But anyway... This is the process of individuation as outlined in these scriptures, right? And using this Jungian way of interpreting them, this is what we come to. These are the principles we come to, right? Okay. Uh, now, let me read this quote by Jung, all right? Open quote. This means, in other words, that in such cases, the ego is a suffering bystander who decides nothing but submits to a decision and surrender unconsciously. The genius of man, the higher and more spacious part of him, whose extent no one knows, has the final word. It is therefore well to examine carefully the psychological aspect of the individuation process in the light of Christian tradition which can describe it for us with an exactness and impressiveness far surpassing our feeble attempts. Even though the Christian image of the self, Christ, lacks the shadow that properly belongs to it. Close quote. So you can see there from that passage why I think it's appropriate to dig into the Christian scriptures and see them as this psychological underpinning structure 
of, of this individuation process, right? And I just want to tag on to the end of that, that Jung sees the Christ image as representing the self, right? Um, but he does see it ultimately as it lacking an aspect of the shadow, you know, and, and he kind of talks about it as the devil in Christianity was separated from the Godhead. And, and Jung would like to uh, put the devil back into the picture because that's really just the shadow of God. Okay, I just thought I'd add that in there just for some extra context. All right, so, so there we go. That principle there, all that talk is to say you must pay a price to become yourself. Right In the practical sense, you have to offer up an actual work. You have to pick some actual objective value, um, an equivalent way or um, something that you create. You have to create that equivalent to offer up as a value exchange for your freedom to individuate. And also committing to this process to individuate can be dangerous. You know, it's something that you don't take lightly. Right? And that's what we learn from the Christian scriptures. Okay? So we've got that. All right. Now let's move on to the next thing. So the next thing here that I've written down as a, as a, as a kind of a guiding um, principle is that you have to remain in alignment with your higher identity. Right? Mm -hmm. And because a lot of this has to do with your identity, right? Who you are, who you're becoming. And in Jungian psychology, it's an alignment with the archetype of the self, right? Um, and in the Christian scriptures, there's this idea, and there's this quote, and I'll, and I'll open quote, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you, close quote. So that's what Jesus said, right? And if we, if we analyze that uh, through the Jungian lens, we can see that you seek first the kingdom of God, so the ultimate value in your psyche. And then he says something interesting, and his righteousness. So there is this idea of righteousness or right living or living in accordance to the laws or principles, right? So when I'm saying remain in alignment with your higher identity, I'm saying there is a sense of yourself when you think, who am I? And you think, and you get that sense of, of who you are and the potential building up in you. You want to re remain in alignment with that and identify um, with that becoming a reality. And you don't want to disobey that. You don't want to turn your back on that. You want to be righteous. You want to live rightly in alignment with that inner principle that is yourself. Your law that you're trying to live out, your value, that unique value that you've discovered in yourself that you're trying to live out and actualize, you want to live in alignment with it, right? That's what righteousness is in this context that I'm trying to speak about it, right? It's living in alignment with that inner principle and value, okay? Now, uh, the next point I want to go to is that because it is like the ego is trying to expand, you know, your consciousness is trying to expand and assimilate unconscious processes, you, the smaller personality is trying to assimilate the greater personality, you don't always know where you're going, right? Because you only know more about yourself once you grow into yourself, then reflect back inwards, right? And so... Uh, this next principle uh, of becoming yourself is to be flexible, right? Don't overly identify with one path or way or it has to be like this. You, you, you trust in the process of what's happening, right? And so I'll illustrate it through these quotes. Open quote. Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails, Close quote. So that's from the Bible, from Proverbs, right? And so the idea there is the conscious mind makes plans. You make plans. I want to do this and that. But ultimately, this scripture says the Lord's purpose will prevail. We could see that in psychology as the unconscious instincts prevail. 
Because you are a certain type of structure, going back to that Nietzschean idea. And that's also this idea of you live out these certain drives and instincts that are just a part of you that you're born with, right? And those instincts, you might have an instinct to create, an instinct to do this or that. You might not even be conscious of that. Um, but that's kind of what Jung meant by the archetype too. He linked the archetype to the instinct because once an instinct, an instinct is like this um, unconscious repetitive behavior that you do. You, you live out this sequence detailed behavior um, that's inbuilt in you. And the archetype is like that, but it's, it's, um, it's like the instinct of the mind or the instinct of perception. And you live out a certain pattern, which is what archetype is, a pattern you live out this certain pattern of behavior or mind um, that has a beginning, middle, and end. So it's a, a narrative form and structure, right? So in this sense, you're living out the Lord's purpose or pattern that is already uh, built into you uh, despite your conscious rationalizations, you see? And so that's why there's wisdom in this, and, and it can be completely natural, and that doesn't actually have to be a metaphysical God anyway, right? And if you do believe in that too, then whatever, like everyone's welcome here. I'm just saying, you can view this purely through a psychoanalytic lens, depth psychology. All right, next quote, open quote. Now, listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to this city, you will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this and that. As it is, as it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil, close quote. So you see there, uh, in that part of the Bible, he's talking and he's saying, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this and that. So it's something like aligning your conscious mind with the, the smaller personality, with the greater personality that you haven't assimilated, the idea of wholeness, the, the, the archetype of the self. It's aligning yourself with that wholeness and saying whatever um, the, that archetype, where that wants to take me, I will go. See, this is the process of individuation adapted to the inner reality. Um, so you might, your rational mind might think of certain things, but your, uh, irrational aspects might take over, right? That's basically a part of this process. That's why you've got to be flexible. And sometimes you can hamper yourself if you're too rigid, because then you're working against yourself. Your conscious mind is working against what the unconscious is trying to bring forth for you. So really I'm trying to help you, um, get in touch with, that inner reality, right? Now this fits in with Nietzsche, Nietzsche's idea. So let me show you this quote by Nietzsche. Open quote, the organizing idea that is destined to rule keeps growing deep down. It, br it begins to command. Slowly, it brings us back from side roads and wrong roads. It prepares single qualities and fitnesses that will one day prove to be indispensable as means toward a whole. One by one, it trains all subservient capacities before giving any hint of the dominant task, goal, aim, or meaning. Close quote. So you can see there in that quote that there's this organizing idea like that's similar to the archetype of the self or similar to what Christians call God. And it begins to command, right? It brings us back from side roads and wrong roads, right? So we go and we think, oh, I should do this. I should do that. And it, then, it, then it brings us back, right? And it, in this quote here, it trains us up. It trains us up with all these different capacities. And we don't know what it's trying to do, but it's this idea of wholeness. It tries to, you know, we might live all the experience in your life is not nothing, right? Everything you've done all accumulates to bringing towards some type of wholeness, right? It's like this tapestry weaved together. You don't know this little thread is happening right now that you're conscious of. But when you look back at the totality of your life, like a mandala, 
you see the totality of your life and you're like, wow, I did all these things. I went here and I did this and, and it all just kind of connected together, right? That's this idea that deep down there's this organizing idea, right? And Nietzsche would not see that in, in, in a religious way. He sees that, um, you know, purely from a secular point of view. Right? So that's what I'm trying to say. This is like depth psychology, psychoanalytic um, type of descriptions of our inner realities. Okay? All right. Now, let me bring you to this principle that I really love and enjoy. And so I think that this principle is going to really help you. And it's going to counterbalance some of the teaching that's out there in the world around these types of topics that we, that we talk about, right? Now, this principle of knowing and becoming yourself, I want to share it with you now. It is the importance of joy. It's the importance of joy. Now, it sounds so simple, <laughs> but man, I'll explain it a little bit further for you and once you catch this revelation, right, once you get it and, you know, I hope that you can connect into kind of what I'm connected into now because I really want to share this, right? But it's something that you have to feel, right? Because joy is actually something you feel, right? And so, um, yeah, the importance of joy, joy is important for knowing and becoming yourself. Joy is necessary for knowing and becoming yourself because it enables you to see your potential and it motivates you to move towards it. That, in a nutshell, is what it is. Now, let me expand on that so you believe me, <laughs> all right? Because, uh, you know, sometimes it's getting it across someone's mind that's trying to resist this type of stuff. Okay, so first of all, you know, I just want to say, I think Jordan Peterson has this wrong, right? I respect Jordan Peterson. You know, he's a professor. He, he knows a lot more than me in many ways, right? Um, but in on this point, I think he's wrong because Jordan Peterson publicly has said that he thinks Joseph Campbell's follow your bliss is wrong. And I'm saying, no, I think Joseph Campbell got it right. I think Joseph Campbell got follow your bliss right. Okay, because follow your bliss links up with this idea that I'm talking about with the importance of joy, right, for self-actualization. Now, I want to say that, first of all, Peterson, even in kind of a recent video, has said that he, he's not really the most joyful person. He even, he even said that, right? And you can kind of tell that anyway, you know, like it's not, I don't think that should be a controversial point. Um, he said it, he admitted himself anyway. So the first thing is he doesn't actually experience this. So, um, you know, that's probably why he doesn't get really what Joseph Campbell's talking about. Cause it, it's something you have to experience. Right. Um, and that's okay. Whatever. So, um, let me share this, right? There's this, um, common thing in the Bible right? And it is that, here it is. Okay, here's a quote from the Bible. Open quote, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Close quote. So, it's right there, right? The kingdom of God, which is the build up of the value in your soul, involves joy. It involves joy. So the actualization of, of your full potential involves joy, right? It actually involves joy. Um, and now, let me, let me describe it in more kind of present day terms. There's a theory called Broaden and Build. It's a Broaden and Build model by Barbara Fredrickson, right? And this Broaden and Build model is based on positive psychology. And it basically suggests that we have 
that positive emotions broaden our awareness and encourage us to seek out new things and stimuli, right? And so it's the idea that if you have positive emotions, your perception is now broader. Your, possi the, your perception of your potential is broader and then you go act on that newfound perception that is stimulated through positive emotion. And then in doing that action, you are increasing the quality and well-being of your life. And that creates what's called an upward spiral, right? Because now you've increased the quality of your life. And now you receive more positive emotion. And now you look out to the world and see more opportunity and more more potential and then the more you can broaden your perspective and see your potential you can build on that opened awareness and you access that through uh, positive emotion right and so this is um, you know more modern psychology they've studied this stuff with positive emotions and so this idea of joy I think is necessary because we know that when you're depressed you begin to have black and white rigid thinking and your thoughts become very fixed in a, in a bounded way. They become very narrow. You don't want that. So that's the whole idea of positive emotion, right? Now, in the, the modern psychology, they say, okay, well, how do you get the positive emotion? Well, basically, you spend time with friends. You spend time with friends. You try to actually do something that you feel gives you joy. You know, you go and do hobbies, activities, you make time to do things that give you joy, right? That's the whole idea. You spend time with people, you, um, you know, you do things that increase positive emotion. You can exercise, you can get out and about, you know, maybe there's something particular that you like doing that will help you. Um, so that's the modern thing, but the ancient thing, the... The archetypal ideas from the religious um, stuff is the kingdom of God. It's the inner value. You connect with something in you. Uh, and when, when you connect with that deep inner value, you receive this deep joy. And it comes out. And, and I'll share with you um, some ways to do that um, through these other quotes I have here. Okay, so that's a modern psychology approach. There's also another one. Uh, Another model called the PERMA model of well-being, right? And this is from Martin Seligman, who, who is, I think, the founder of uh, positive psychology, or at least one of the initial initiators of it. So Martin, Dr. Martin Seligman, um, he made this idea, this, this model called the PERMA model. And these are different elements that you five elements or components that make up your well-being. Now, this idea of well-being or flourishing, they're a bit like buzzwords in psychology, in pop psychology, right? But they map onto these religious experiences from, from um, Christianity. They map onto what um, Joseph Campbell talked about. They map onto um, even what... Uh, Jung talks about a lot as well sometimes um, because one of the uh, alchemical texts that Jung quotes actually um, yeah I, I've actually put it in here so I'll read that out soon the alchemical text that that relates to divine joy all right and so anyway the perma model by Martin Seligman P stands for positive emotion right and so you, that's one element. If you work on, it contributes to your well-being, right? And that well-being uh, results in job satisfaction, life satisfaction, right? And there's many other elements to the PERMA model. You can look it up. Um, there's positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning, and accomplishments, right? So these are all here for you to look up as well and look further into. Okay, so um, when you... So here we go. So here's another quote, all right? Open quote. You enter the forest at the darkest point where there is no path, where there's, a, where there's a way or path, it is someone else's path. 
each human being is a unique phenomenon. The idea is to find your own pathway to bliss, close quote. So that is from Joseph Campbell in his book, Pathways to Bliss. All right. So again, see how it fits into the idea of you have your own unique path. And Joseph Campbell talks about how we can learn from mythology and stuff like that. But ultimately, you have your own path to take and you have to follow your bliss, which means you get that sense deep in you. There's this inner sense of, of joy, something that, that is blissful for you. If you follow that inner, that inner sense or that still small voice, it's described in the Bible, then it will lead you to this, um, this work or this path that you've got to take that gives you joy. Take that path because that path uh, will open doors, is what Joseph Campbell says. It will open doors for you like never before. Um, now, let me, let me take that idea of Joseph Campbell and then compare it to the Christian scriptures. Okay, open quote. Until now, you've not asked the Father for anything in my name, but, but now ask and keep on asking and you will receive so that your joy may be full and complete, close quote. So that's Jesus speaking to uh, his disciples saying, ask in my name, so your joy may be full and complete, All right? Um, okay, here's another scripture. Open quote, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and brought and bought that field, close quote. So you see how it's tying together the idea of the ultimate value in the soul, the kingdom of God, expanding into the higher personality, the self. It's done through joy. That is a guidance, a, a, um, a result and a guidance and, and something you live in as you undergo the process of individuation or as you go undergo the process of becoming yourself. It involves joy. All right? I'm trying to give this to you as a present. Receive the joy, honestly. You don't need to be, you know, like... <laughs> Like you look at some people and they're just so miserable and it's okay. We'll have those times are necessary. Remember, you have to give up a price. There is a tension to this. There is this, it's very hard to, to actualize and become yourself. And there's tension and there's anxiety that can motivate it. But there's also joy. There's also these, these peaks and valleys and there's times of, of intense joy, right? All right, let's move on to this. This is an alchemical... Uh, like I read out before, John Portage, Jung quotes this in his writings, right? In the practice of psychotherapy. So open quote, now is the stone shaped, the elixir of life prepared, the love child or the child of love born, the new birth completed and the work made whole and perfect. Farewell, fool, hell, curse, death, dragon, beast and serpent. Good night, mortality, fear, sorrow, and misery. For now, redemption, salvation, and recovery of everything that was lost will again come to pass within and without. For now, you have the great secret and mystery of the whole world. You have the pearl of love. You have the unchangeable, eternal essence of divine joy from which all healing virtue and all multiplying power come, from which their activity proceeds, the active power of the Holy Ghost, close quote. So that is an alchemical text talking about this inner process. That's like a poem talking about this inner process of the ultimate value, right? The, the philosopher's stone, the divine joy, the secret, the pearl of love, you know, this hidden ultimate value. And, and you see, it's, it's with all, which all healing and virtue come from. This idea of wholeness is also an idea of healing. And that's why you receive this inner joy when you adapt to the inner reality, which is a deep exploration of yourself, 
right? And and um, it's an unfolding and relationship with the higher part of your personality that um, releases to you this healing, this divine joy, this identity of wholeness and 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 bigness and more than what you are, expanding your potential, right? And so I wanted to put that in there because it clearly shows from multiple sources, from the Bible, from these alchemical texts, from modern psychology, from Joseph Campbell, this idea of joy, right? And personally, I have this revelation of joy, you know, so I want to share it. I, I think it's highly important that you actually experience joy, right? And that guides you in this process of becoming yourself, right? All right, there's just this last quote to close this joy chapter off. Open quote. If you wait at wisdom's doorway, longing to hear a word for every day, joy will break forth within you as you listen for what I'll say. Close quote. You can see there, this is a, a proverb from the Bible in the book of Proverbs. This is the Passion Translation. It's actually a real interesting translation. I love it. I love it because it's got this, this joyful, emotional language, right? And that, that's ultimately what this is, right? This is tapping into your emotions, but it's the deep emotions. It's not just these fleeting emotions on the surface. It's the deep structure of your personality, the emotional side of your personality, right? And it says here, if you wait at wisdom's doorway, which in the book of Proverbs, it talks about wisdom as a woman, and Jung translates that as Sophia, the deity of Sophia. So that's the other archetype, you know, the missing archetype of God. So um, as God is seen as traditionally as masculine, this is a counterbalance in the psyche that wisdom was portrayed as a woman and she was there at the very foundations when God created the world. That's the mythology behind in the book of Proverbs, right? And so if you wait at wisdom's doorway, so you're waiting, you're, you're, you're trying to connect to the unconscious, right? Longing to hear a word for every day. So you're trying to get some wisdom from the unconscious. Joy will break forth within you as you listen for what I'll say. Joy is a part of this process and this relationship of connecting to your unconscious, you know, building that access and relationship to the transpersonal or to the archetype of the self or in old language to God, right? Or in this case, wisdom. Sophia, right? So that's that. Joy is a part of the process. So let's move on to some of the more practical elements of uh, knowing and becoming yourself. So we kind of talked about, you know, Jung, Nietzsche, religion, all these depth psychology, psychoanalytic processes of, of how to analyze, knowing a deep introspection of yourself and, uh, and then actualizing and becoming that identity, bringing forth those values, bringing forth a work, um, adapting to the inner reality. But now we're going to shift gears and try to just look at it through more of, I guess, a personal development, self-discovery type, the, the practical elements of this as well, right? So you, what you want to do is you want to self-reflect a lot. If you want to know yourself, you want to reflect on yourself a lot, okay? You want to look at your strengths, okay? Uh, that's one of the things you want to do because your strengths are an indicator of where you should go, what you should practically do. And your strengths are a part of who you fundamentally are, right? It's unique to you. Not everyone has the same strengths as everyone else. So that's how you find your niche. That's how you find your place in the world and in life, right? That's how you orient yourself to a task, you know, or to a work, right? To create that value exchange. Okay. So what I want you to do is, is there's this good, um, you know, modern psychology, positive psychology stuff. It's called VIA Character Strengths. I'll link it in the description. Look up that. You don't need to pay for the full thing. Just do the basic thing for free. And um, it will give you, I think, your top three strengths. And uh, that will help you a little bit, guide you a little bit. 
All right, what's your strengths? These are character strengths. I can share with you my top one was the love of learning. Now that might make sense to you. Look at all these quotes, all these things I'm sharing with you, my YouTube channel. Obviously I love learning, right? But I wouldn't be able to do this without that being my strength. That's what I'm here to give to you. And I have a gift that I can actually understand things and then I can actually communicate it and hopefully I'm communicating it in a way that's intelligible to you so you can grab it and receive it into yourself and apply it to your life. That's my function here. See, so that's an example of what this is. You find your strength, right? Love of learning for me and the love of like, you know, knowledge and stuff like that. And I've applied it in this context, this particular context of creating, researching things and creating a video for you. And then, and that's the value I'm giving to you, right? And so you need to go away, find your strengths and try to put them into an actual circumstance. See, an actual context, that's what you have to do. Another way to look at strengths is gifts. These are things you're naturally good at that you were born with, right? Some people are just born and they're just, they're just good at this or they're good at that. And then, and talents, right? So they're all similar things. Strengths, gifts, talents. There's also something called, um, I can't remember its name quite, but it's uh, something Strengths Finder. Just look up Strengths Finder book on Google. It will probably come up. And that has, that looks at different strengths as well. So you want to find your strengths. Next thing is um, your personality, right? So, your strengths will link to your personality. But so with personality, you can look at psychological types, Jung's psychological types. He's got a book called Psychological Types. You can read that. At the back, it talks about the different types. You can also look up M MBTI, the Myers Briggs. Um, you can look at the Big Five, the Enneagram. But what I want to give you a warning is don't get stuck in that. They're there to help you, they're just tools to help you to explore yourself and other people, but don't get stuck in it, okay? You don't want to just become a personality person, right? Because I see a lot of people and they just get stuck in it and they never grow out of it. They're just tools to help you. Really what you want to do is you want to be hyper-specific, okay? You want to be hyper-specific. You want to look at patterns in your own life and you want to see how you behave think and feel across time in different situations. And you want to look at what is the repeat things of what you do. If you do that, you understand yourself reflecting on who you are as a person, okay? Hopefully you'll become more conscious of how you actually act and who you are. Sometimes you can modify that. Sometimes you can go with it and expand that, build on that, make it work for you. That's really the most important part. So if you spend time with people, you talk with people, afterwards think to yourself, how did I act in that situation? What did I say to that person? What did they say to me and how did I respond? What was I like? Was I overbearing? Was I, you know, and, and don't get too caught up in this and become anxious, but just try to understand your patterns of behavior, thoughts, and, 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 your, and thinking, right? And sometimes it's good to listen to other people. If lots of people have said something about you and they're different sources from different places, you will probably bet, make a, it's a good bet to say that that's probably something true about you. If someone has said, a lot of people have told me, hey, you're really creative or you've got a really creative mind or you've got a lot of good ideas. People, I've seen that from lots of different sources. So I know, okay, one of my strengths is generating ideas playing with ideas, thinking in the idea realm, communicating with ideas, right? Not everyone does that, right? Some people are better with their hands. Some people are better doing admin tasks. Some people are better with abstract ideas. That's what, that's what I'm good at. That's a part of my personality, right? I'm an extroverted intuitive, so I can play with ideas easily. So look for patterns, all right? Now, another thing from that, from your personality, from your strengths, another thing is, is to look for your values. What do you actually value in life? Just because you're good at something, 
doesn't mean you actually value it. See how they're different? See? So you got to try to find what you really value. I did create this document that has all these values, but you can type it into Google, list of values or list of psychological values or something like that, right? It will come up with all these different values and you can think of your own, right? There's so many of them. Do you value family? Do you value, do you value duty? Do you value honesty, truth? Uh, do you value, you know, servitude to God? Do you value creativity, freedom? Uh, do you value uh, relationships, love? Do you value self-knowledge? Do you value learning? You know, all these different values that you can value, right? So why you want to do that is you want to actually discover what you really do value in life. Once you do that, you can orient, you can find a direction. You can, you can find a task to do that this, that is nested within your set of values. You can use your strengths in the practical uh, project that you're doing within that um, field and, and while you're living out those values and use the strengths of your personality and try to structure what you do around your personality as much as you can, right? And this all takes time. It takes time to self-reflect, but it also takes time to actually manifest this in real life because this is something that is a challenge. It's, it's hard to do. It's not something that just happens overnight, right? This is a big process that probably takes years to do, okay? And the next thing is, so they're kind of the innate things, personality, values, strengths, right? Then we move to skills, knowledge, and experience. So based on that structure of personality, based on those strengths, based on how you operate and what you value and you desire and what you seek and how you naturally function, you want to build on top of that skill. You want, you want to actually build tangible skills that can be used in actual projects and in, actual, and in actual tasks to create objective value for the world. That's what you want. And for yourself. So you want to have skills and knowledge. So you, you want to up your knowledge in whatever field or whatever aspect of the world you're trying to conquer, so to speak. And you want to become really sharp in your skills. Sometimes you want to do an extra course or learn from people or just spend time practicing to build those skills and learning to build the knowledge, right? Or just doing the task itself to become experienced. And you also want to have lots of experiences. So all your experiences in your life have given you something. No matter what you've done, where you've been, you've had certain experiences. You can use them to uniquely craft um, a way in the world as well. Because your unique experience is a unique story. It's a unique idea. It's what gives you the edge. Even though you might be a writer and there's a thousand other writers, you're a unique individual with a specific experience and you're bringing that to the table, right? So there's that as well. There's also, you can learn about yourself through playing different roles as well. You know, if you become a father, you have now, you learn more about that fatherly, fatherly aspect of yourself through playing that role. It's the same as being a salesman. You learn more about the presenter, you know, side of yourself, you know. So playing a role, as much as it is a persona, don't get lost in it. Don't only identify with it. But you can learn from these things, kind of like an, the idea of apprenticeship, right? Okay, and, but you can learn that to self-reflect on yourself. It's a self-reflective tool to learn about yourself, what you're good at, how you function in certain situations, right? And then another self-reflection tool, of course, is your dreams. So I have a probably, I think it's about a 10-year dream journal. And you just wake up every morning. As soon as you wake up, you grab your phone, go to the notes app, and just type in your dream. Simple as that, done. Later on, look at it and try to understand it. What the hell is going on in these rooms? And it can be hard. I've got some videos on my channel um, that look at Jungian dream analysis and also Freudian dream analysis. So um, you can look into that. Dreams are 
have been really important for me. They've taught me about myself. Um, they taught me how to integrate my thinking and my feeling together through different series of dreams, right? Sometimes it's just automatic, really. Uh, this process, this healing type process happens, but it does reveal an aspect of yourself that you're unaware of. That's Jung's um, ideas on dreams anyway. Uh, so that's something practical you can do, but there's all those other practical things you can do as well. Now, that's kind of self-reflection. They are That's self-reflection, self-reflection, knowing yourself. Now, to actually become yourself, you want to take all that you are, your personality, your values, the structure of who you are, and build upon that the skills, the knowledge, the experience. And then you want to place that in uh, an actual task and goal. You actually want to actualize what you're doing and bring that value that you have in you, transmute your personality into a manifestation of your potential in the actual world, in something concrete, like um, a tangible goal of some sort, right? So I have a goal to create these videos to bring you guys insights into ideas and to help you expand your life as a creative being, right? So you can live in the fullness of who you are and actualize your potential. That's my goal to use my strengths to to give that to you. To And I have to actually sit here and create this video and do it, right? And so that's a goal and you nest that goal in a project. The overall project is this whole YouTube channel. My goal today is to create this video. See, so a goal nested in a project and that project might have an ending or it might be an ongoing project, right? And then that's how you get this sense of overall purpose. So the purpose is like this fuzzy kind of thing. Like my purpose is to share with you um, insight and knowledge to expand your conscious awareness of your potential and of these other ideas so you can live to the fullest in your life and so I can also do the same. That's that's my overall purpose. And how I do that is I have a project, of this is my project, the YouTube channel, and my goal is to create X amount of videos, right? And read, read this book and read that book so I can understand knowledge and then use my gifts, strengths, talents to convey them to you. That's an example a personal example, but you have to take that in your life and apply it to you. What are your strengths? What are your values? Reflect on your personality and how you act in certain situations and throughout life, right? What are your skills, your knowledge, your experience? Maybe you got experience from work or at home or through doing this course or just through living life, right? Um, and then what are, what is your tangible goal that you're going to do right now that contributes to a bigger project that ultimately has some purpose or meaning in your life. See, you don't, it doesn't, there doesn't need to be like, um, people always down and speak bad about the idea of purpose, right? Oh, life has no purpose, but you, you can create out of yourself a purpose, Right, and it's that is your life's task, really, to bring forth a purpose and a goal, and to strengthen yourself so that you can actualize uh, these creative things that come f- from and that are built upon who you are as a person. If you do that, that is basically what individuation is, because now you've undergone the value exchange and created something objectively valuable for other people and society. But you have done it in such a way where you have lived out the fullness of your personality and built on that identity and um, used your identity to create value for people, right? And in exchange, they've allowed you to live your life because you've done your part now, you know? And so um, that's that whole idea uh, in general of self-actualization, right? And so... What you want to do is you always want to be trying to improve. Life is 
um, peaks and valleys. So sometimes you do go backwards a little bit. But ultimately, to challenge yourself, you want to be in what's called the zone of proximal development. And so that's basically where your level of competence meets the level of challenge just at the right spot. And sometimes you can get someone to help you, a model or someone um, that can help you, like an apprenticeship or someone you learn from, because you're trying to acquire knowledge and skills to get better. And that's how you make sure you're always growing and actualizing your potential that your competence level meets the level of challenge. So you're not, you're not bored by doing something that's below your competency and you're not so stressed out that the challenge is way too hard. You're setting an appropriate uh, challenge for your competency and you're trying to push yourself just at that, 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 that right point to grow into, um, into actualizing what you um, are trying to achieve and who you're trying to become. Right, so that's uh, a practical element to that, and that it, you know, that speaks into the idea, the idea of self-actualization, right? That we know common in psychology from people like Maslow, and from um, uh, Goldstein and other others like that. But those modern psychology approaches, they also map onto Jung's idea of wholeness, um, because it's this idea of self-actualization. All right, uh, living to your full potential. So I hope that uh, this video has been uh, good for you. If you have liked it, then please uh, let me know that you've liked it. And um, I'm going to be releasing some more videos. Um, I've got a book on Nietzsche. Uh, I've got some other stuff on Jung. I've got Jung and Phenomenology is going to be a video I've got because I've been trying to learn more about phenomenology. And I'm trying to learn more about the idea of value itself from different perspectives, from uh, philosophy, from psychology, uh, even from economics. And um, I've got this other book on creativity. And so I'm going to keep um, creating videos um, like this, but also about various topics, still about Jung. And I hope to be more creative. I hope I can continue to give this value to you guys and let me know what you want from me as well. Um, you know, I don't always like when someone like tells me what I should do, but because um, sometimes I find it demotivating. But at the same time, I do like to hear what you guys are liking because it does give me some feedback so I can um, become more successful. And so um, I appreciate you listening. I hope that you are well in these times. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me back. If you've listened this far, I thank you very much. And I'm, um, I'm very happy to be back. And I uh, wish you all the best. I really do. And so I hope um, you get, you've got something out of this and that you can actually actualize something in your life. I really want to hear from you uh, if you have begun to put some of this into practice. That would be the most beneficial for people to hear as well. Uh, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.